sponsor. I'm also very grateful to Nicole. He's going to have a quick word here. Nicole, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you so much, Pete, for the introduction. So my name is Rodolfo Guin from Necodex. I'm founder. And what we do is we help companies uh, to hire remotely teams from uh, graphic designers, software engineers, creatives as graphic designer or marketing strategists uh, remotely. Uh, we work in the BOT model. That means we build, we, trans we operate and transfer your teams. So if you are looking to hire uh, your teams remotely, send me a message or reach out at netcodex.com to schedule a meeting. Thanks so much, Rodolfo. And these guys have done fantastic work for Side Pocket, for Presenta, and other folks in the community. If you're building a product, definitely check them out at netcodex.com. Uh, so today we are thrilled to be discussing the beautiful and fascinating world of building community, specifically tactics that work for growing your community in 2023 uh, and also finding your champion. So we have the distinct pleasure to introduce Reynaldo, Paredes, who is actually Peter, Peter's boss, so hopefully we'll get Peter fired today. <laughs> Let's try that. Doing our job. <laughs> Hi, and so we're gonna we'll be uh, we'll be exploring those and figuring out how to help the help our founders and community. So, uh, Ronaldo, do you want to kind of kick us off here and uh, share a little bit of background on yourself? Yeah, yeah sure. So, Ray Paredes, uh, thanks for having me. Global head of community at Intel. Um, I'm Brazilian. That's why the accent. Um, I have been at Intel for um, almost six years now here in, in the U.S. in the HQ team. And uh, previous to that, I was leading social media for Latin America. Um, I've been always the guy raising the flag of community and then advocating for our users, customers, and then saying, hey, this is um, how we should be doing things. It's true way uh, we should be. Um, talking with, not talking at, right? Um, and we have been through a long journey building community at Intel and building the practice at Intel. Um, and I'm lucky to uh, be part of that team and driving some of that, that journey. We are currently um, building a center of excellence so that we can help other groups and other teams at Intel build communities and then drive... Um, two-way conversations, build advocacy programs, and et cetera. Um, and that's that's pretty much what we're trying to do here right now. Quick question. And so, yeah. For, for people who are not, um, I guess, familiar with the term, what is a center of excellence? Oh, that's a good, uh, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, a center of excellence is a group of people who are, who have a different, uh, you know, um, expertise, uh, a diverse team, that can help accelerate and enable others to build new programs, implement new tactics, uh, find ways to execute or build some of the, the plans uh, that those teams are, are um, um, looking for. It's a team that has a very uh, deep expertise into a topic, into a theme, into a discipline that can help and enable other groups um, at the company. So it's almost That's like a QA board, or if um, if someone is creating, like, or if someone is creating like a new department or a product, this is kind of a group that just makes sure that the, they follow whatever pillars, whatever. Um, like, Best practices, yeah. um, follow the guidelines, the standards. But it goes beyond that. It's not just about guidelines and governance. I think it's about enablement as well. I think it's it's not just forcing people to follow the rules and the, the best practice, right? It's about enabling and helping them to do what's right for the brain, for our customers, and thinking about different ways to get that job done as well. So it's not just about throwing a bunch of documentation on people and then say, hey, this is how you get this thing done. Uh, we are there for them as well. We we are helping them to strategize and execute some of those programs as well. So let's let's zoom out a little bit. So as head of community for Intel, what does that mean? Help our help our audience understand. That's a that's a good question. Uh, community for us, it's it's uh, it's a group of individuals that band together for a common interest, right? 
they are collaborating, sharing things, helping each other. They happen to congregate in different platforms. They could congregate on Reddit, Discord, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn, different platforms or even events. And um, what we are looking at is how do we nurture those uh, conversations and how do we support those those users and customers in different platforms and events? Um, and because Intel has different business units and product lines, we have communities all over the place, right? Uh, the center of excellence is that group that will help us to be more efficient, consolidate, and then get smarter on how we execute that work. Um, and Peter is one of um, is part of one of those teams that is looking at ways for us to engage with with our audiences and build relationship with them, and then ensure that we have this authentic two-way um, conversation with our audiences or communities, right? Peter, do you want to brag a little bit and share about the, the growth in TikTok since you since you started? I, I love sharing this story, but I feel like when, when Ray and I first, when I had my second interview at Intel, I was talking with Ray, our interview was supposed to be, what, like 40, 30 minutes or 45 minutes. It ended up going 45 minutes over nice. because the last five minutes we decided to talk about TikTok. Really? And you know me, I, I can't <laughs> shut up about TikTok. <laughs> We're Gen Z, no one loves yeah, Gen Z. Right. We're in so the, we, I think at 15 minutes in, Ray was like, are you able to continue? I was like, are you able to continue? <laughs> so it's kind of aggressive. <laughs> so I feel like I was initially brought on to uh, work on Twitter, but like because of my unique skill set, we decided to do this really interesting pilot on seeing like how, how much of a what presence Intel can garner on TikTok, and within I believe it was within eight months we were able to grow the audience from eight thousand to about hundred thousand. Oh God! And that's the torch of the future, getting yeah. to the next generation. Right? And we did it without like we did it solely by just teaching kids or just teaching people like random stuff about semiconductors, about computers, about tech. Going with like an education first uh, method. It, it, I think, I think what I think, and to be very honest, I think the reason it's working there is because we have a good thing. We have the finger on the pulse of what's going on and what they care about, right? I think ultimately it's about understanding those conversations people are having, what's resonating, what's not resonating, what what they expect from us, right? It's not just a strong step on people doing more advertising. Hopefully we'll end up doing less advertising and having more two-way conversation. Sometimes it's it's you, Peter, um, engaging with an influencer and creating content with, with that person, right? So um, it's it should be two-way. Um, it should be conversational, right? Um, and TikTok, it, it, it's interesting because we have creators or influencers that are influencing everyone right now if you think about how we make purchases right we we listen to people like us we go to people like us we hear what you know um people with some credibility are are talking about and and we we need that type of connection with people like us and that's why people go to TikTok. um and and we need to understand um what those conversations are so we can be part of um those communities there right those niches it's 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 less about this broad um one way type of marketing and it's less it's it's more focused it's it's two way it's more niche and and it's it's more conversational and that's the biggest like difference between community versus just traditional marketing because with community, you're at least, the, these communities are going to spring up regardless of Intel. Like mm -hmm. with, if, if we never had a, a TikTok, people are still gonna be talking about Intel products. So by having a presence here, we could at least one, manage the conversation, like uh, put out fires before they get become too viral or um, just be like, Build better brand loyalty because if you, you know if 
people get a reply or get a video comment or just some kind of interaction from the company that they love, then it's gonna ma it's gonna impact them a lot. It's exciting. More. It is exciting. So yeah. So Microsoft bought Intel. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft Microsoft bought LinkedIn. Um, doesn't it, wouldn't it make sense for, for for Intel to do something similar um, to be able to kind of control the conversation or control the channel to some degree? Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, <laughs> I think I think I think what we are very likely to do. Oh, go ahead, Peter. Uh, I was going to say we. So off camera, Nick and I have a lot of debate because this dude, this dude is Team Apple. He is an Apple guy through and through. Okay. Mom, mom was there for thirty years. So, I got to meet Jobs when I was twelve. She met Tim Cook a couple weeks ago. That's right. That's right. And. So we like we I get we get into so many fun debates. So his his where he's coming from with this question is why doesn't Intel own the supply chain like Apple? <laughs> yeah, I mean on any channels like that as well. I, mean, I guess that's true, happens. but Apple like, we, I mean, we have tried to build products and communities ourselves. We had like two or three, maybe four different products and services that we created over the last years. But it's really tough to build something ourselves, right? And that's where most of the work that we are doing right now, the community team, it's going where people are. Instead of building a community, instead of building a platform for people to go, right? It, think about the movement. It's like, hey, can you guys move from where you are right now and then come here? Why would they come to us, right? So we, we, we prefer going where they are participating, um, assuming that sometimes we'll be guests, right, in, in those communities. Um, and to be very honest with you, I mean, if, if we will buy a, a platform, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't, I mean, it might not make sense for us. Yeah. Um, I think we'll probably spend more time and efforts trying to build good products. Um, and then support people where they are, right? You know, ensure that we have um, the right team answering questions, helping people to troubleshoot when they are downloading a software, trying to implement something, um, providing education, right? Um, so sometimes it's it's about answering questions. Sometimes it about it's about offering training. Sometimes it's about offering certificates for people to brag about and say, hey, I am certified. I know this, this thing, this product, this solution. I can help other companies with that. Um, I, I think we are probably um, not, I, I, I don't want to say we will not, but um, sure. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, and it's, it's important consideration though, if you will do, um, understand like you mentioned understand your customers and not only where they are now but where you know where they'll be in the future as well sharon you've also been able to have a, a tremendous amount of success with modern luxury um how do you approach community when you're thinking of like these events and bringing people together and kind of like organic momentum yeah absolutely i literally just wrote down a quote from you because i'm gonna steal it <laughs> um i love this idea of it's not advertising it's two-way conversation um and that's something that you know i think so I'm the publisher of Silicon Valley magazine and people are like, is that an oxymoron? Um, you know, magazine, Silicon Valley. Um, but you know, we've had so much support because I think that's exactly what we are. It's a framework for people to have conversations. In fact, we're creating a eight part um, series called the Silicon Valley San Francisco magazine innovation summit, where we're literally cool. building these conversations for people to talk about um, one is inspired um, around Gen Z because of Peter and his <laughs> great voice supporting them. I um, know. You know, I think we all have a responsibility to use our platforms and whether that's you guys, um, you know, educating Gen Z on, you know, the future and your products and how they can be more effective citizens and um, in their job and in the world. I think, I think that's an incredibly important uh, mission that you guys are undertaking. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And, and I am a, I do believe that um, community should be at the core. And you can change the word community to um, customers, audience, but ultimately it's about the people there, there, right? They are not just 
consuming, purchasing things. It's about, again, authentic two-way conversations. It's about feedback loop. Feedback, uh, loop. It's about offering ways um, for people to talk about and exchange ideas. Um, and this is what the internet is, is offering for us right now. It's about the network that is behind the internet, right? And people do that in different ways and places. Um, it's smart. If you can do that, you know, with your customers, if you can learn from them, engage with them, build relationship with them, why not doing that, right? How would you um, characterize, how would you characterize Intel's voice though? Um, I would say we, we, we are always pushing innovation and thought leadership, um, building an ecosystem, right? And as we do that, we need to bring people along. We need to look at, you know, not just um, people who are distributing and selling our products, but, you know, software. We need to look at um, partners and people that you end up using our um, products to build something else. I like to think about us as an enabler, as mm -hmm. someone that is sparking, awesome. you know, those ideas and, and helping others to build something else, right? So that we can then um, enrich the lives of every person on earth. So that's kind of what, what we, we try to do. Mm -hmm. um, but because we are an ingredient brand, mm -hmm. we need to think more holistically and think about that ecosystem, right? Um, that's why we touch different communities, different groups of individuals. Um, and that's why also I think um, we should not think about community as a, a place. It's about those groups of individuals and they sometimes, depending on their needs, they will go to a place to have problem A solved. They go to another place. The same group of people go to place B to have another thing solved, right? Or to just to collaborate with others. So um, understanding the, the challenges that we have um, is critical for us. And understanding which voice and how we want to enable each one of those different groups of people is critical because there is no one size fits all, right? Developers, they need different things. Our customers, they need different things. People who are playing games need different things. If you think about the differences between gamers and um, developers, gamers need performance. And then they want to have fun. Yes. They want a PC, a laptop, laptop that works, you know, amazingly well. That will not um, drop a minute, and then they will just play games um, and then have fun. And then we can expand that, and then offer ways for them to connect with others, have fun in person. And then that's why we sponsor esports events. And then our voice and and how we approach uh, gamers is different than developers. Developers, they, they're like, okay, tell me more about this. No, no BS, um, <laughs> you know, I want to download something, see if it works, implement, and then I want someone to answer my questions pretty quick here and troubleshoot whatever I need, and then let's just do it. It's it's different, it's more, it's more like boom, 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 developers, and then, Gamers, let's have fun. Let's you know go to events. That's why Intel is has one vision and purpose, but we show up in different ways depending on the audience, the community, the group of people that we want to you know talk to and collaborate and engage with. And that's one thing that surprised me through when I first started at Intel was just seeing like the different things that Intel is involved with. And all of that is, for example, I didn't realize that Intel creates CPUs for autonomous driving, Yeah, for example, <laughs> um, or drones, or like the, I mean, more and more like nuance, the difference between like a normal cus like customer facing CPU and like a day, a, a, um, one for developers, one for, for uh, data centers, one for like, and, it goes the the differences go from like crazy 
interesting. Um, for example, Tangle Lake is the quantum one. Yeah. <laughs> or Loihi yeah, yeah. 2 with the neuromorphic one. Which just came one. out, right? Tangle yeah. Lake, I think. I, I'm not, I don't quote me on that. <laughs> I'm not sure when that came out. I just, I know that it is out. <laughs> okay. Um, all, all the way down to like the, uh, the, the normal I fives to I, uh, sorry. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, the I, the I fives, I sevens, sure. and then to like the Evos. Peter, Peter's like, what can I say? <laughs> I wasn't, I was blanking. I didn't know if we had an I nine or an I three. <laughs> I, I know there was no, three of them. He's getting fired. <laughs> you got both. I mean, from, from an ingredient perspective, you know, Intel is, it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty sexy approach. I mean, my impression of Intel has completely changed after, after hearing about what you guys are are building, but I, I am curious. I want to hit back on the how you are able to empower champions and and scale that. But before we get there, Ray, can you talk a little bit about quantifying the return on investment for community? That's uh, uh, the one million dollar question. Yes, one billion <laughs> dollar question. Um, it's it's not an easy task. Um, we have been exploring different ways to do that. Um, we do rely a, a lot of, you know, a lot on engagement and sentiment. Mm. Um, but ultimately, we're looking for ways to um, look at our community members and, and how much revenue uh, those participants are driving and compare that with people that are not necessarily part of that community, uh -huh. right? Um, it's not again. It's it's not super simple. Um, we are um, getting there. It's not something that we can easily get into a number and then oh yeah, that's 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 how we do it and here's the number. But that's what we are looking for. There are different ways and there are different things in between um, very operational metrics and and, and revenue uh, and real ROI, right? Which is like we, we can we can send surveys um, to our uh, members and then ask about uh, brand affinity, purchase intent, and things like that. It gives us some direction. Okay. But it's hard to tie that to you know ROI, right? That would be so, a good example of like a like a cognitive, right? Like a test uh, as opposed to behavioral, just like how somebody navigates a website. And like a really cool kind of versioning field of, of data is biometrics. So like being able to uh, monitor EKGs or or how much somebody's sweating or like or pupil dilation or where they're looking. I mean, if anybody can figure that out, it's probably Intel. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or me sitting next to Peter with his boss <laughs> on the podcast. Speaking of which, we have, speaking of bio, well, actually, this has nothing to do with biometrics, but I just wanted to add, <laughs> speaking of biometrics, I just want to do a hard literal. transition to some questions from the audience, actually. And, Ooh, okay. And this is cool because I can actually just bring up their questions right oh, here on the bottom of the screen. Gosh. Yeah, awesome. so this question is from, um, from <laughs> how do you know if your community is working, if it's impacting its members and the business? Josh, good question. Yeah, for sure. Love Josh in common room, folks. Um, yeah, so that's exactly uh, what I was just talking about, right? Um, we we are looking at different ways to improve the way we have been measuring uh, that work. Um, and Josh, I think you know that um, really well. Um, but um, ideally, we would like to be in a place where we can connect um, our communities to Salesforce, to CRM, right? And then see the impact um, that our, of our work um, with those customers. They are asking questions. They are engaging with our communities. They are attending events. They are participating to activities or anything that we are offering them. Um, so that we can measure that along along the time, and um, it's it's definitely where we want to go. Uh, we are not there yet, um, and then we'll definitely count on some partners to help us um, get there. By the way, shout out to Common Room. Common Room is a platform that kind of answers the question that you were talking about. How do you? Yeah. Quantify 
by measuring measure yeah. community across different channels or per channel or I don't know, Josh. Is it across different channels? <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It is. I mean, I, I mean, they have they have fifteen plus integrations: Reddit, Discord, Twitter, LinkedIn. Oh, okay. Um, and many others. So yes, and the beauty of a solution like Common Room is we we can look at um, the group of people, not necessarily not just the channels, right? The way we have been doing marketing for years and years is we have a channel, we have content, we distribute that content through that channel. What I think um, solutions like Common Room um, is bringing to the market is let's take a look at those people that are engaging with a brand cross channel and then have a 360 view on that engagement. And then it's about the the person, it's not about the channel, right? So it's it's just shifting how we um, we look at um, the work and, and the, the the how we prioritize um, channel versus um, those engagements and individuals engaging with with the brand. One more question from Josh before we jump over to Jessica. Um, what advice would you give for a company thinking about starting mm. their own community? Where should they start? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and we are going through that. Um, I mean, we are doing that right now with um, a few <laughs> groups here in Tel uh, through the Center of Excellence, right? Um, which is again is this this team that we created to help and enable all the groups to build new new programs or to. Um, get better or whatever uh, they're doing already. So I will definitely start connecting with people that are already part of that particular community. We probably have subject matter experts in the business unit, in other groups that are very active there that probably know those community members or that community very well. How can we learn more about those individuals, what they care about, what they need, and what we as a brand have to offer to them. I think it's uh, it's it's almost like um, doing a lot of research. Uh, so as as we do more research, we will have to identify what they care about, what and what we can offer that is valuable to them. The most important thing um, I would say is find something that you can offer that they care about that they that will resonate that they need from 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 you um if you have clarity on that everything else i think will will, will come easily um and ultimately think about how can you give more than than take right um and you start small and and learn and iterate as you go but do not start with like a solution with a platform Let's not start with a with a vendor with a platform and then say, okay, I have this platform. Let's adapt this program or this this community uh, program that I'm building to that platform. I think it's the opposite. Um, sometimes I go to events and the first question after you know asking my name and what I do, people are like, which platform do you use? Um, sometimes I I, I want to say, but I sometimes I. I don't say that. I just think, uh, but I don't care about the platform. I mean, what really matters is what we are offering them. And sometimes people will go from one place to another, mm -hmm. right? Uh, again, it's about the group of people. It's not just about one particular platform. But that's, but see, that's a little bit different because Intel has so much, so many resources to be able to put on each of these channels. But for a startup that needs to focus, what kind of advice yeah. would you give on? Oh, I, I can just. Say, I will <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm raising my hand. <laughs> so, so, point at the QR code. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I mean, over here. This, this one. <laughs> so, in terms of, uh, as a, because of uh, a startup tends to, like, in, in a startup, realistically, this will just be either the founder or the marketing person, the CMO, doing this test. And from my past experiences uh, using this exact same model, I would actually find existing uh, and burgeoning like active communities that align really closely to whatever 
problem the startup is trying to wow. solve. That's abstract. I love it. Um, I, I want to give you, well, I will, I will bring it more concrete in a second. <laughs> and what you could do is when you join these groups, instead of directing all the attention towards like me, 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 the th uh, think about what is the most immediate value you could give to the community. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, nice. Before Intel, I was working at this company called, um, they're, uh, I think they changed their name to Momento now. They used to be called Ribbon. Huh? What they did, Ribbon offered a pay, essentially they built you a paywall for all of your Zoom classes. So this is one of those COVID uh, startups that kind of popped out. They, sure. are, they were a YC grad, um, oh. like a month into the YC. Um, and they wanted, essentially they, the, all of their users were yoga instructors, dance instructors, cooking teachers, people who had a Zoom class, but they needed help with essentially learning how to online market mm -hmm. because they're in this, all of them were all playing the same in the same playing field. They all, because of a global pandemic, got uprooted from a physical storefront into an online store. Became front. creators. Exactly. They yeah. all became creators. Yeah. So my role was, I was essentially teaching people internally how to do uh, online marketing, but it's, we figured we should just tap into existing creators of their kind outside of our community. So in Facebook groups, Reddit groups, um, Quora, Quora threads, and um, Joe go in and just provide immediate value. Hey, these are some, like, thank you for allowing me to join this group. Here are like three templates we use to, uh, to, for your Zoom. Meeting with value. Yeah. yeah. But at some point you need to, splinter off and and do your own thing and, and manage that transition in a way that doesn't alienate the original group yeah how do you how do you do that um whatever what at some point in terms of like providing like comment being involved in facebook groups uh commenting on reddit there will be a point where you're going to be driving users offline from like point a to point b and that's actually where you want to get to that point as quickly as possible really right like, like to like in-person events? Um, you could be in-person events. It could be like, it, it's whatever your call to action is. So if you want people to sign up for your product, for example, then you could say like, Hey, um, this, like all of my, I, I happen to be working on a product that like solves X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. I know we talked a lot about that. I know this is a big pain point in this group. Um, like I want to share it with you. Got it. This is, uh, it's gotta be done gracefully. Though. Exactly. It has to be done yeah, gracefully yeah. because when that happens, like, you want it to get to a point where when that happens, um, it just doesn't feel like it's a paid promotion. Right, right. And that's where and that's where you can test some concepts and some ideas and, and things that you are planning to offer to them at an event, right? Mm -hmm. at, at a webcast, as an example. Um, and, and sometimes I would say people might be thinking too much and strategizing too much, but come up with some hypothesis and then test, right? And run small events. So you don't have to fully commit to, you know, a platform, to content, to rewards, to like something bigger. You do a one-off, an event, or even if you don't, if you're not ready yet, like host, you know, it could be a Zoom call with 10, 20, 30 people. Um, test that, right? I think those are opportunities for maybe startups to um, test whatever um, they're trying to achieve with, with that particular community. And, and I think one thing that I think it's really, really critical, it's, it's, it's like if you want to be part of a community, ensure that um, you have someone in the team or the whole team ideally that knows that community really well, that is part of that community really well, right? Again, gaming hopefully everyone touching the gaming community is a gamer right yeah. um, so you can speak their language so um eventually you will not have to test things eventually you know exactly what you can provide that is valuable to that particular community yeah I, I, oh yeah go ahead sure. oh no was just... I, I remember when i was in junior high i was uh, i was watching a, watching a clip in school where this uh, this woman was saying, well, you know, we're the cool hunters, and, and we go find out what kids think is cool. And I remember thinking, like, that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I get it though. You, like being able to get into a specific group and figure out where 
where the puck is going. Um, and so that's kind of maybe maybe in answer to your question before, Peter, you could you could hire somebody who's already kind of a, like a leader in that community mm, to be yeah. able to kind of bring that into your own thing, whatever you're yeah. building, right? Exactly. And that's like on the spectrum of like how bootstrapped you want to get uh, of your to your to your question. If you're yeah, if you have a little, if you're able to throw money at the problem, then definitely bring someone on who like is like intimately familiar with that right. particular has community. A gravitas. Speaking yeah. of bootstrapping it's kind of interesting like intel fortune 50 company but also leveraging some some tactics and strategies of of startups how would you characterize what uh, what intel's doing in that capacity right hmm i think we are looking at ways to be more agile deeply connected um, and we are definitely looking at communities as a way to learn, engage, um, and, 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 you know, have the finger on the pulse of those um, audiences or customers um, that, you know, how we would traditionally call them. Um, I think there are different groups at Intel that um, are more um, engaged and deeply invested in, into communities and some are more than others. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely something that I think we as our group, I can tell for sure, and other groups as well are, again, big company, right? It's, um, it's definitely something that we need to um, learn from and, and then and do more and then behave as um, as I start off, um, and then be more agile, and then um, sometimes start small and then grow over time, knowing that we have lots of resources available. Uh, but you might think, well, it's a big company. Sometimes the resources are not available at all, right? Mm -hmm. We have been acting as as a startup for, I would say, um, for some of the work we are doing. We we are starting small with one resource or investing 10k here 50k there and then growing over time right mm -hmm. um we have programs that started with nothing people it was basically a side job and then um after some time we started putting more resources because we started seeing um great results there right um we definitely so a lot of test and learn strategies as well that's but you got to be measuring to be able to yeah. get that data, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is more less on the community side, more on the social side. God, God. I mean, it's kind of probably play it together. Yeah. 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 You want to ask the next question? Yeah. For and our last time? comment uh, is what is the most viral com campaign you have watched? I'll let you answer that. Well, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> that was a T. There's a lot of. That was a good <laughs> Thank you for the T. <laughs> uh, I think. Um, yeah, I'll let you answer that, Peter. But but I think there are some good stuff that um, we are doing um, that maybe I I, I want to share, which is um, again understanding that we are not necessarily driving most of the conversations. That we are part of something bigger. That we're part of you know, or that we want to be part of a trend. Right. I think when we jump into a trend is when we see the magic happens happening um and then when we understand that um you know there are other stakeholders and other people involved that maybe have more credibility or they have a big um fan base and they maybe they will be the ones driving that uh, on behalf of our company so partnering with people like them um is is important um and then I'll let you answer um, and then have, maybe you can deep dive on some stuff you have been doing on TikTok, TikTok, uh, TikTok theater, but um, you know, some examples like you identifying um, questions people are, you know, posting on different um, videos, not necessarily videos we created, and then we go and answer those questions, right? Uh, reaching people that are not necessarily following us, right uh but you know leveraging other people's audiences and then simply being there for um our communities 
it's it, I think it's critical. And then sometimes things will, you know, will, will turn that into, I don't know, 500,000 views, a million views. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes we're lucky, right? Um, and, and most of the time, I mean, most of the times when that happens is because um, we are not necessarily trying to drive something ourselves. We are just um, participating to someone else. Um, so what content do you think conversations. That has worked from, from your perspective, Peter? Um, typically, when we, whenever we jump onto a trend, if we make it unique, if we make it uniquely Intel, then it definitely uh, gets very, very like positive love. For example, our most successful, and to answer your question, Jessica, our most viral campaign, at least on TikTok that I've seen, is something that actually came out of a 45-minute discussion that I wasn't even involved with, actually. This was a, a video that one of our uh, subject matter experts did when they were at a conference. Mm -hmm. um, he was talking to someone who was actually managing Intel's YouTube, and he was, he, and Aaron yeah. <laughs> was talking to Marcus, <laughs> and one oh, yeah, of the YouTube one. person was like, oh man, I don't understand TikTok, I don't know how it works. Um, our uh, SME, Aaron, was pulled out his phone and said, here, look, I want to make you a TikTok real quick, I want to show you. He happened to be at a, at the food, the, the food thing, mm -hmm. and the food thing, <laughs> <laughs> the food bar, the food area, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they had a lot of tiny foods. Okay. So he and he used that. He used it kind of. He found it somehow. Found it a way to relate it to Intel, and it got two million views. It went something like this: micro chicken and waffle, micro grilled cheese, micro chip. Uh, <laughs> that's clever. And boom, two million views. Yeah. And, and counting. Yeah. Wow. And, and so from a, and to kind of like dial this back a little bit um, to be able to help our founders out, what what percentage of their content should be um, reactions and, and current trends versus evergreen content? How do you, how do you look at that? Hmm. No, go ahead, Peter. This will be different on, um, on the uh, different social medias, but I feel like Twitter and TikTok are the same. Um, that number is typically higher on those just because Twitter and TikTok move very quickly. Sure. But if you take into account LinkedIn or Facebook, those uh, I feel like those platforms rely more on planned content um, versus and whereas the reactive content tends to exist more in the comment section. So that mm. but so in, in in terms of more like faster paced um platforms like TikTok and Twitter, I would say a good 50% should be reactionary. And the other 50% should be evergreen. Okay. And the reactionary is it's 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 where we are seeing growth and, and where we are seeing really good engagement. Right. Um again it's it's just because it's not just us talking about ourselves. We're talking about something that people care about at that moment. Um and sometimes it's just creating a new video, answering a question, trying to educate people about something else that they're interested to learn more, right? So um, it's two way, right? And that's how we should be using those platforms. It's not just a, a place to dump content and then and then leave. Um, I agree. I think 50 50 is, 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 is a good number, um, but it does require um, resources and okay. in, in processes in place. Span, uh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Have you found that the attention span is, is pretty much the same across these channels, or does it tend to vary? No, LinkedIn attention span is so long. Yeah. I'm so impressed. Why, why, do you, why do you think that is? <laughs> We have we we have an average of we we let's I want to uh, pull back the curtain of our show a little bit. We're currently getting about uh, we've been averaging between twelve to fourteen uh, viewers now mm -hmm. on our stream. If I if we went live on TikTok, we would go from a hundred to three to thirty to twelve to 50 and that's just the nature of the app mm -hmm. because people are you on linkedin for a specific purpose people are on linkedin to learn to people are probably taking courses they're probably searching for jobs they're probably right. networking where but people are i mean 
TikTok is more akin to Facebook. Like you're on there to hang out. You're on there to be entertained. Sure. Maybe like Clubhouse. But but conversely, Clubhouse, we had like 60, 70, 80 people mm-hmm. per show. And then we, you know, switching on over to LinkedIn that, that dialed back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's because this, this is still a relatively, uh, I mean, LinkedIn Live, uh, I guess it's been available for about a year. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a little bit less. Whenever you convert followers from one platform to another, that's always really hard. Fall off, maybe. Yeah, yeah. because there, the, some, we we never really know why people follow us. Uh, it could be because they really like our pretty faces, yeah, <laughs> or or it could be because they like the content, or it's because they like using Clubhouse. So when you when we switched from Clubhouse to LinkedIn Live, when we transitioned when we transitioned exactly yeah. from <laughs> Clubhouse to LinkedIn Live. Yeah, we did. I mean, we we it might have just been that like all of those listens that we've got was due to just Clubhouse really promoting. And SEOing the crap out of our our podcast, got it. Where I we weren't able to get yeah. that benefit from here. And the reason they go to each platform is different as well. The use case is different, right? It's 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 hard to like do the same thing across the board and then expect people to behave the same way, right? Um, I think it's it's tough, and we have seen that um, as well. We do need to customize our approach, and then you know really look at platform by platform, because if we try to do a one size fits all, it, it, it won't work. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of interesting too, because like content creators, it, they're not, they're repurposing their content for all these different channels by, by and large, like, you know, YouTube to Instagram to TikTok, you know, like a lot of the, that content's consistent because TikTok, for, for example, hasn't figured out a way to incentivize users to only have their content on that channel. And they can figure out how to crack that nut and monetize and go public. I mean, I think that would uh, probably change the trajectory of the platform. Oh yeah, I think mean, that's, we'll add that to the list of things that they need to yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you're getting awareness and then engagement and then uh, acquisition, but then also advocacy. It's crazy to me that sometimes your biggest critics end up turning out to be your biggest champions. You know? At least that's that's happened in the past. <laughs> Speaking of which, Reynaldo, um, I was. I just called Ray. <laughs> but Reynaldo's more fun. I, I don't know from the Ray. Um, Whatever. I was gonna put you on the spot and have you give Peter a performance review because why oh not God. the hell out of him Hot water. Um, while we're on with his boss? But I think I mean as fun as that would be, I think it's quite clear that, I mean, you hired someone who's passionate and an expert in building community. Mm. Um, and, you know, understanding that layoffs are happening in a pretty big way across the yeah. tech community. And also talking to you before, it sounds like you have positions opened. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you identify talent and how you can kind of tell that you're hiring a Peter and not a dud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who's dead? I mean, um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I think uh, we tend to, we, we try to hire people that um, like people, that, you know, you would like to have a conversation in real life, uh, that you would like to have nearby. So I can tell in the first five, 10 minutes into a, um, you know, interview, if, if that person is able to deal with ambiguity, if that person is able to have a conversation right and then if that person um can can show up um and, and be authentic and then uh comfortable um in front of you know someone else during the interview yeah um but also i think ultimately um we 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 always try to bring people who are flexible who are willing to go to you know the last mile and then build new things and create new things. We brought Peter because of his creativity, because yeah. of the way he thinks about uh, <laughs> things, the way he connects the dots and, and you know, and, and then, and again, for each community, we think about what that community needs and what are the different um, um, skill sets that we, we need, right? It's totally different where we're hiring for, and then we have a, 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 an open position now for data center, which we are trying to hire somebody who is part of that community already, who knows that community, 
who understand cloud computing, who understand, you know, who, who know, um, you know, our product, who knows our products eventually ideal, right? Um, so Peter is, is looking at um, a TikTok audience and it's, it's more into social um, and it's, it's driven, it's tapping into, into um, trends. So looking at, um, you know, the specific um, audience or community we are trying to be part of, that will then give us the needs of that specific position. But ultimately, someone passionate about community, someone that, you know, can talk about, you know, numbers and results, ideate new things that will be pushing the limits and the boundaries and then um, bringing new ideas and ways to engage and, and drive conversations, right? Um, so that's kind of what, what we are always looking for. Um, and, and, especially, and, and that's true for people that are actually there in the trenches and then executing some of those programs. But on the other hand, we, we have a team that is here, the Center of Excellence team, where we, we are always looking for people that can act as a consultant, an internal consultant to other groups, right? Somebody who can help and educate, who can provide guidance, who can make recommendations. Um, so again, it, different roles and different skill sets, but um, most of the time, um, people that want to collaborate with one another, people that you know want to push the boundaries, passionate about people, community. I think if there is one thing, it's always um, bringing people who 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 is passionate about the work and, and community, and and you know. Um, what we are trying to build here. So passion, if, if the person has passion, everything else <laughs> will, will come. Um, and that's, that's, that's it. It's, it's not so easy. If that sounds like you and you're interested in working with Intel, definitely reach out to, to Peter or Ray. Ray, how yeah. else can we be valuable? Uh, how can our community be valuable to what you and the, the team at Intel are, are building? I mean, engage with us, uh, follow us. Um, again, if, if you know anybody that is willing to build communities or is community building already, um, let us know. We are looking for talented people uh, for both data center, for the center of excellence as well. Um, yeah. And I'm happy to, you know, answer any other question, help um, um, and, and support others as well. I'm Love here for you too. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, you know, we, we also have a, a fun question for you too from Conscious Conversations. This is our friend Jules, and these are these are lovely. It kind of dials back from the from the technology and gets a little bit more closely connected. I love to it. And being an element. So Sharon, we're gonna so have that way you could tap into what you learned in cloud school. <laughs> uh oh. Punk, punk. Uh -oh. Should, should we put this one back? No, it's a great one. Okay, good. What is the worst job you ever had? Ooh. Okay. Wow. That, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after this commercial break. Job you can do Peter, you can ask. Well, you can answer that. But be careful. So, yeah. So, uh, if, if you're in the audience and you want to answer the question, Peter, you can drop the link in the chat. And mm -hmm. what is the worst job you've ever had? So, who wants to kick this off first? Ray, would you, would you like to, to start us off here? Oh man, I um, I worked as an intern um, at a bank during the dot com oh. bubble. Um, again, it was a bank that acquired a startup, and then it was not a culture fit. It it did not work. And there I was, creative mind, you know, trying to learn a lot, and then you know full of ideas into a place where, you know, there was, you know, they, they wanted to uh, act and, and then build things as a startup. And then that's why they acquired um, a company at that time. But it was tough. It was a sh shock of cultures and yeah. it didn't work. And there I was in the middle of everything early in my career. And then I was not ready for that. And then um, I basically laughed. Yeah. 
probably give you a chance to, you know, uh, appreciate the highs all the more because you went through that, uh, that I'm sure is a, a, a painful, difficult experience as well. Yeah. Who's next? The worst job I ever had was when I was in college, I spent one day selling shower curtains <laughs> at the Javits Center in New York. And I enjoyed the selling process. The problem was is all the shower curtains had little dots and they all had names related to little dots. So I sold a lot of shower curtains, but afterwards the owner couldn't <laughs> which shower curtains I sold because I couldn't tell the difference between like mini bubbles, bubbles, like it was insane. So yeah, I, I'm not cut out to sell shower curtains. But now you, you got one of the coolest jobs around. I have one of the coolest jobs, yeah. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Yeah. rock star slash socialite, <laughs> community builder, savant, you yeah. know. Uh, for me, actually, it was this is also in college. I found never answer. Be very suspicious when you click on Craigslist ads. <laughs> and that's my biggest takeaway. I, I don't know if uh -oh. how many people on the call also experienced this, but I was one of those people selling car wax at the side of gas stations. Oh no! Um, I answered an ad. They were saying there. Uh, it was a fast track to own your own business quote unquote yeah we they had me go to various different gas stations around the sacramento area i was in davis at the time and we basically set up a table this is free demos i went up to every person filling up gas asked them like would you like a free demo and then we we're supposed to sell car wax ultimately though it really helped me with like dealing with people like yeah. there was a lot of good that came out of this but the only bad thing was i didn't get paid <laughs> <laughs> What, what did it help you with? Like, uh, oh, it helped me with like with getting over with just like cold, essentially I was cold calling. Yeah, I was yeah. cold calling. I don't like, know. I exactly, but then it wasn't cold calling. It was cold walking. Yeah. So I thought it's pretty cool. It was kind of cool. I want to see um, a cold cold walking dance. Yeah, it was, and but but it was it was what was not cool was standing under the hot Sacramento sun for eight hours oh yeah walking up to people filling gas strangers i can imagine getting, like, <laughs> like get away from my car <laughs> yeah no, exactly 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 thanks well I, I worked at pier one imports for oh. uh for like four or five months when i was 16 and i mean that was awful I, it was because it was just like it was over the christmas season so I, i'm pretty sure i heard the same 12 songs by uh not mariah twain or, uh, or Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey. Shania Twain. Shania Twain. Yeah. And yeah, I basically hated Christmas music like after that. But uh, but I mean, it was it's one of those things that gives you um, it gives you clarity on what you don't want. So like KPIs of of you know the stuff you're not interested. in. Christmas carols. So, exactly. So um, and then we got Ro. Who do you want to read the question? Yeah. Me so Ro? Ro said, "I was lucky to have some great jobs, but the worst is to be a back end engineer." with no idea of what is happening on the front lines. Oh. It was kind of write the code and then I'd sign off at 5 p.m. Yeah, gotta have open communication. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Awesome, so any uh, any parting words you wanna share with us here, Ray? Thank you so much, it's been just wonderful to have you, have you on the show here. No, thank you all, it was fun. Appreciate you, uh, it was really good. Um, thanks for having me, appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. And Ray, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, thank you so much for being here. It's fun to have you here. Check out the codex.com and Numera Negocios. These are our lovely sponsors, and be sure to tune in next week where we'll have more of the best brains in the Bay. Until then, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And don't forget to scan this QR code. Yeah, this, this guy uh, over here. We do. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, over there. Yeah, that one. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Our newsletter. Thank Our you. newsletter. Go. Come on, Ray. Thanks, y'all. Bye.